So in this week's lesson, we're going to be out and about in um, around Bristol Square and we are going to be looking at aperture or aperture priority and we're going to create depth or we're going to take depth away. So um, of all the lessons that we're going to do, this part of the exposure triangle, this part of the process is the one that can make your images look very, very different um, and immediately obviously different. Okay, so we'll look at using aperture priority mode and in this little presentation I'll talk about aperture itself. So look at aperture. I want to also cover focal lengths because I've been sort of prompting you guys to try and vary them as well but I just wanted to explain a little bit about focal lengths and what um, maybe why to use certain focal lengths and what it'll do to your image. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about semi-automatic modes on your camera because there's certain things you need to understand about them um, and the one that we're using this week. And we're going to talk about exposure. Um, we're going to come on to uh, a lesson where we're going to shoot completely manually. Um, so I just wanted to kind of introduce the, sub the sort of elements of exposure that we're, that we're going to be looking at. Um, and ultimately why the meter um, is important to understand a little bit about. And I'll talk about this, the practical task that you're going to be doing in the session with me on Tuesday night. So let's talk about aperture. What is aperture? So aperture is the size of the opening in the lens of a camera, uh, a camera lens that allows in light. So it's measured in f-stops. And an example or two examples at the opposite extremes, you would have f1.8, which would be considered a wide open aperture and f22, which would be a stop down aperture. And we'll, we'll talk about those terms as we go through. So the lower the number, the larger um, the aperture, physical size of the aperture, uh, and the more light that enters the camera, the higher the f-stop number the smaller the aperture that lets the light into the camera. And you can see the image on the right here. It's quite a good one because it shows you the aperture blades and you can see the little hole, the little aperture in the middle. If you're a filmmaker, sometimes they call it the iris. Same idea. It's quite a good analogy because if you think about your eye, it's doing the exact same thing. So when you look, uh, if you walked into or out into a bright room or lights got switched on from a dark room, and you were looking at the pupil of your eye, you would see that it would dilate or it would constrict to reduce or increase the amount of light that it's bringing into its um, sensor. And, and humans, obviously, we're talking about the optic system. Okay, so these are some um, illustrations that show different aperture values. Um, so f one point four again is a very wide open aperture. F two, f two eight, f four, f five point six. We talk about f-stops, we talk about apertures, it's the same thing. Um, and f, the f represents um, an aperture, okay? So what does aperture do? Aperture changes the amount of light that's coming through your camera, and that's fine. Um, obviously, that also needs to be balanced off by changing your shutter speed. Not sure if you know that, but the it's almost like a seesaw. If you keep your... ISO at the same place um, because you know the conditions are maybe dark or bright. At that point, if you change your aperture value, you need to also change your shutter speed value to get a balanced exposure. But what it also does is it changes something called your depth of field, sometimes re referred to as DOF, DOF, depth of field. So what's depth of field? So depth of field is the critical um, focus of your image. So the amount of Im the image that you perceive obviously on a flat um, flat version of what you see uh, that's captured in your sensor, um, how much of it's in sharp focus. So where the sharpness starts and where the sharpness ends. And aperture controls that. So it makes a massive difference to your image. Um, so sometimes I want to really throw the background out of an image. So if I'm shooting, sometimes I'll be shooting a wedding and the venue's really not great. So it's, um, uh, you know, not, not the best um, venue in the world. So, but you still want to get really good shots. 
So I would a lot of times use wide open apertures. So I use fast lenses, what we call fast lenses with wide apertures. So I can gather lots and lots of light in, which helps me to get shutter speeds that can be hand holdable. As well as that, it can also throw the background out. So when we look at an image like the one at the top, um, and this person's pretty close to the camera, you're focusing on the person. So the depth of field will be a third in front and two thirds behind. But here, the focus, the sharp focus is stopping, ending here. So this tree in the background will be blurry. They will be nice and sharp and it will be blurry. So that creates quite a nice contrast. So sharpness and softness are a contrast as well as tonal values. Whereas down the bottom here, if we're shooting again, same focal distance, um, and then this one would be using a stop down aperture. So maybe F16 or F11, you can see here. And with this one, we've got a really big depth of field. But if you can imagine, because it's a really stop down aperture, if you look at the physical size of the hole, it takes much, much, much longer for the light to then go through enough to make a nice balanced exposure. And because of that, you need to consider your shutter speeds as well. Okay. The illustration here shows a tripod, but if you uh, can't have to hand hold, obviously you need to consider that as well. Okay. And if you look at the aperture ranges f1.4 uh, all the way down to f16. So again, this is letting in le less light, less light, less light. And then as you go up here, it's going more, more light. Okay. And we'll talk about the increments that you see here as well. So. This has got more depth of field. This has got less depth of field. And it's not a given that you shoot every portrait fully wide open. Um, there's reasons why you might want to shoot, um, again, with different apertures where you might need more depth. So how much a, a, a depth do you need? It really depends on the subject, what you're photographing. Um, I photograph a lot of interiors and a lot of the time I want to have quite a lot of depth um, in my image. So my lens basically has a bit of a sweet spot about f11, the, the super wide that I use on, on interiors a lot of it. I know that at f11 the image will be really, really sharp um, and it will also have lots and lots of depth. I'm always al um, almost always shooting on a tripod, so my shutter speed can be seconds if it needs to be. Um, and it's really up to you how much you want to be in focus or not in focus. Okay. Some older lenses and maybe some modern as well also have these markings here. This is quite useful because you can see that at a given aperture value, f11, f16, f22, um, it gives you how much is in sharp focus from front to back. So these markings can be useful. In reality, now we've got digital uh, versions of these. Um, and if you're on manual focus on some um, mirrorless cameras, you can also, there's something called zebra stripes that will show you what exactly is in focus and what's not. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can visualize your depth with that. So as I said, depth of field is an area of sharp focus. And the thing to remember is whatever point you're focusing on, and last week we changed the focusing point, so we can be in control of exactly where in our scene, how deep into our scene we're focusing on. Okay. Wherever that focus point is, you have one third in front and two thirds behind. If you look here, one third in front, two thirds behind. Whatever the depth of field for that given aperture is, you've got a third in front and two thirds behind. Okay. That's how um, it works optically. And you can see here F1.8, very shallow depth field. Um, F5.6, which is kind of in the middle, F5.6, F8 is about in the middle of most lenses. It'll be a nice sharp aperture. Um, but this has got, again, a third in front, two thirds, but more depth of field. Then F16, you've got lots of depth of field. Okay. So consider the effect that shallow depth field um, has on your image and where you want to focus on. So you your subject is important, their distance to the camera is important, because what you'll find is if you had f1.4 and you focused on the horizon line and took a shot, and then you looked at f16, focused on the horizon line and same shot, 
there will not be much of a difference at all because the depth of field is on the horizon line extending backwards and slightly forwards. Okay, If you want an exaggerated shallow depth of field, get the subject to get as close to the camera lens as it will focus and then open your aperture up as wide as it will go, so the smallest number it will do, um, and then you'll get fall off, what we call fall off to the background. Okay. So just a couple of really um, cheesy examples. This is something I shot for a, a workshop I did for Christmas Direct um, for the Stills Gallery. So um, so here is F16. So that as I go through the examples here, um, you'll see the aperture value on the right hand side. Okay, So you can see this has got a reasonable depth to it. F11, F8, if you Look at the, the background image in particular. F5, 6, nice and sharp at the front. F4, F2, 8, really sort of dropping off, falling away. This becomes more of an abstract. F2, and then F1.4. So this is quite a fast little lens. The one thing to remember when you go fully open, if you can look in particular at this element here, Oops, if I go to f2, it's really nice and tack sharp. If I go to 1.4, it's soft. So even the, the areas that are meant to be in critical focus, um, they're starting to bloom. And this is quite a nice lens for portraits shot wide open because it softens the down quite a bit. Um, and that's quite flattering for people. But here you can see a marked difference from that to that. It's really quite, um, quite a bit softer. Okay, so that's a fast wide open lens, but you can see here as I go back up to f16, you can see the depth of field changing. And when we're, when we're here, you've basically got a blur in the background, a really soft blur, and you can actually see just how much is in focus here. So not a lot at all. So applying apertures in a practical sense, um, this is a little video from the SQA, so I'm just going to play this. It's only about a minute long because it's quite a good little description of um, apertures. Okay. <laughs> Aperture is a hole within the lens through which light travels. Aperture works in a similar way to your eye. Your pupil gets smaller when the light gets brighter. In photography, the opening in the lens is called aperture. You can decide the size which will allow more or less light to reach the camera's sensor. As the aperture changes, it alters the amount of light that can reach your camera's sensor. A large aperture will allow a lot of light to pass, resulting in a brighter image. A small aperture does the opposite, restricting the light entering and therefore making it darker. Aperture is measured in F numbers. Whenever you see an aperture value, the letter F will appear before the number. The F stands for focal ratio. Size can seem confusing because it is reversed from what you would expect. The large apertures have smaller numbers and the small apertures have the highest numbers. In this image, the exposure time and ISO remain the same. Notice how the image becomes darker as the F number increases and the aperture becomes smaller. Depth of field is the amount of your photograph that appears sharp from front to back. Some images have a thin or shallow depth of field where the background is completely out of focus. Other images have a large or wide depth of field where both foreground and background are sharp. A large aperture results in large amounts of the image being out of focus with only some of the image in focus. A small aperture results in more of the image being in sharp focus. In this mode, the photographer sets the aperture and the camera chooses the most suitable shutter speed. This allows the photographer to control depth of field and to use aperture to control exposure. To recap, aperture is a hole within the lens through which light travels. 
The size of the aperture affects the amount of light entering the camera, so aperture can be used to control exposure. Aperture is measured in F numbers. There is an inverse relationship between F number and aperture. The smaller the F number, the bigger the aperture. The bigger the F number, the smaller the aperture. Depth of field is the amount of your photograph that appears sharp from front to back. Aperture can be used to control depth of field. A large aperture results in a shallow depth of field. A small aperture results in a large depth of field. In aperture priority mode, the photographer selects the aperture and the camera adjusts the shutter speed for correct exposure. Okay, so it's quite a good little explanation. The only confusing part is when they're talking about the image getting darker. Generally speaking, if you're looking to balance your exposure, which 99 times out of 100 you're probably going to do, um, you're going to be adjusting your shutter speed along with your aperture. Even though in an aperture priority mode, you are controlling your aperture, the, the camera will then balance it back. But we'll talk about semi-automatic semi-automatic modes in a second so yeah it's kind of confusing like they, they talked about there um, where the smaller number is a shallower depth of field um, and the larger number is a greater depth field I tend to sort of teach students by saying the smaller smaller number think about the depth being smaller okay um, and just think about that way and not worry about the maths too much you can get a bit confused by the, the mass, and I certainly don't want to go there. So um, so f2.8 is a large aperture. We talk about large and small apertures. Um, but if you think about number-wise, f1.4 is a lot smaller amount. So think smaller, shallower depth field. f16, 16 is a bigger amount, bigger depth field. If you kind of flip it on its head like that, it sometimes is a lot easier to get your head around. Okay. In terms of the mass itself, I don't dwell on it, but f-stop uh, or focal ratio is your focal length in terms of millimetres over your aperture diameter in terms of millimetres. So that's how you calculate your focal length as a mathematical equation. Okay. So it's, we talked about f-stops, aperture values. It's the same thing. Okay. You also you'll see them referred to. Um, like f2.8, f4, f5, 6, f8, f11, f16, f22, f32, it keeps going f64, and the smaller the hole, you, it keeps um, going up and up and up. Okay. So moving from one f stop to the next, the thing to remember, and when we talk about exposure in a minute, we'll go over this again. If you go from one stop, f stop to the next, it doubles or halves the, the amount of light entering uh, your camera lens into your sensor. Okay, so you're either doubling or halving. Okay, this has got more light, this has got less. So when you step this way, you're halving the light. When you step that way, you're doubling the light. Okay, and obviously you're going to do the same thing or the opposite thing with your shutter speeds, but we'll get to that. So when we start talking about the exposure triangle and what it does, uh, you got to get your head around one concept. It should be a really simple one, but people sometimes struggle with it. So apertures, which is the size of the, the hole in your lens, and you can vary it and control it. Shutter speeds, okay? So these are measured in stops, what we call stops. Apertures are also measured in stops. And ISO that we sort of looked at in the first lesson is measured in stops, okay? Each one of these full hops is equivalent, okay? So every time I change an aperture value, I would then change a shutter speed value or an ISO value to get the correct exposure, okay? And each time I do a full hop, one way or the other, it's either doubling or halving the light, and that goes for every single one of these shutter speeds, apertures, and ISO. Halving or doubling the light is a convenient way of calculating your um, exposure values and adjusting. Okay, 
You'll see here as well, though, there are third stop increments in between. It's much easier to teach and understand halving or doubling. Your camera will go to F stops that are not these ones, but these are full stop values. OK. So semi-automatic modes and we've used um, shutter priority already where we've been dragging our shutter and I'll ask you guys to try and maybe freeze motion if you could. Um, we have aperture priority this week or we're covering aperture. So it'll be an AV or um, A. So basically you are controlling your aperture. When I think or when I work say in an event or a wedding or even if I'm photographing product, I think in depth, I think in apertures, I think, okay, this is a, a bottle and I need to be sh front to back sh uh, sharp focus. I want it to be at F11 or something along that line. Okay. If I'm shooting a bride, maybe in a rubbish venue, I'm, I know that I'm going to probably shoot wide open at F1.2 or F1.4 to throw the background out. Okay. So in aperture priority mode, in most of my photography work, I'm going to be in aperture priority mode. I very seldom shoot in manual. I shoot in manual when I'm using flash in particular, but I want the camera to do most of my thinking. I just want to focus on how much is in focus or not. Okay. So in semi-automatic mode like this, the camera controls the ISO and the shutter speed. You can lock down your ISO and I've been trying to encourage you guys to do that depending on the situation and the lighting conditions. Okay. So uh, we've predominantly went from 800 ISO to 1600 when we've been out. And then when we were on tripods, we brought it all the way back down. Okay. So if you lock down your ISO and then you just control your depth with your aperture, the camera will then change your shutter speeds. And that's absolutely fine. If you're hand holding, you also need to consider that your shutter speed should be above a 60th of a second because otherwise you're going to get camera shake. I will bring out tripods again so people will have the ability to shoot on tripods when the light starts to fade a little bit. Okay. So the meter in these modes determines the final image, the final settings. Okay. You're choosing your aperture, but the meter will then balance back ISO and shutter speed to get the exposure correct. So understanding the meter in this situation is essential. So just thinking back what we were sort of looking at, this week's aperture priority, we've looked at shutter priority and we will eventually progress to manual mode and look at the exposure triangle in complete sort of unit, if you like. So you need to understand that aperture priority will manipulate your depth of field, your DOF. Shutter priority, you can selectively stop time or extend it. And in terms of manual mode, you are in complete control um, of the exposure triangle. And you'll see when we get there that that's useful, but also dangerous sometimes. OK. So I just really wanted to go over um, lenses and depth of field just to give you a bit of an understanding of this so that you approach it with a bit of knowledge. Okay. So what are lenses? Maybe going back to rudimentary things here, but it's useful to know. Okay. So lenses reflect, refract light and you can see the example on the right hand side here, a glass of water. And it's something my daughter, my sort of, uh, when she's about six said, dad, why is, why is that uh, weird thing happening with my, my straw? And it's basically because the light is passing from air into a material with a higher refractive index. So it causes light to change direction. It still goes in a straight line because light does that. Um, but it will go and it'll change direction, okay, and create this effect. So the effect can be used to focus an image onto a film plane or a digital sensor, okay. So we can use lenses, and this is a super rudimentary one, but you can see how it's bending or it appears to be bending this um, with the volume of liquid. You can see because um, the edges will be thinner, the center will be thicker and you can see how it refracts the light. So on a very basic level, that is a lens, but it's a bit more complicated than that. With lens design and optics generally, you'll find that they've actually got flaws 
And this goes for a cheap kit lens on a Canon, Nikon, Fuji, whatever, all the way up to Hasselblad, even super high-end uh, medium format sort of digital kit. There are, there are distortions in the lenses. Okay, so when it comes to actually editing our shots, there's a process in the, the software that we use so we can actually correct these little distortions. And sometimes you'll get something called barreling and sometimes you'll get something called pin cushioning like this. So it depends if it's a wide angle lens or a um, telephoto lens, a long lens. Okay, so you can actually correct it in um, camera, excuse me, camera raw um, when we get into that stuff stuff that uh, late, later in this session so um so focal lengths are to do with the optics in your lenses i won't play this i'll just skip through it but this is a really these guys are a really good youtube channel it's all illustrations but they go over lots of stuff that i'm going to talk about uh, in the next little session next little section probably a lot better than i will explain it but um we'll we'll deal with it in practical terms when you're out and about so I'll what just is skip this. Okay. So if you think about focal length, um, a lot of you guys would maybe have an 18 to 55 um, zoom lens on your camera. It's usually the kit lens that people get when they buy their first camera. Some of you might have a 50 mil. So uh, we call it a nifty 50. It's the first lens that I bought after buying my initial camera setup. And it would probably be a fast lens, so an f1.8 lens or something like that. Okay, so when you look through the lens and you have a variable zoom lens, these are give you a small number like a 16 or an 18 millimeter here, all the way up to usually a 50 or a 55 millimeter here. Okay, so you get a wide angle, what we call a wide angle or super wide, some, some people would call them. Um, all the way to a slight telephoto or a standard here. Okay, so you can see that it's about the angle of view, the angle of view that you can see. When you're using really, really long lenses, effectively, you have got a very small angle of view and it's magnifying in some ways the image. Okay, so if you look at an image shot on a wide angle lens, it looks very different to one shot on a 600 mil lens. And we'll see some examples in a little second. Okay. So any focal length below 50 mil is considered a wide angle. Any focal length above 50 mil is considered a telephoto. Um, wide angle lenses tend to create barrel distortion and also um, longer lenses will create pin cushioning. One caveat to this um, is that a lot of you guys will be shooting on something called a crop sensor camera. So when we talk about a full frame camera in terms of digital, it equates to the same physical size as a 35 millimeter film um, still. A lot of people now also shoot on something called crop sensors and the size of the, the sensor itself is much smaller, not much smaller, is what we call a crop factor. So wide angle lenses tend not to be as wide and telephoto lenses are lo appear to be longer. Okay, so on a crop sensor camera, this would be thirty-five millimeters instead of fifty. Okay, effectively, I've shot on crop sensor cameras commercially for a long, long time, um, and it's interesting. Nobody ever asks you if you shoot on full frame or crop. Um, I also shoot on medium format, which is much bigger than full frame um, digital, but it's basically the tools for the job that you need. Okay, so crop sensors, slightly different field of view for each one of these focal lengths. And again, here's some examples. 14 millimeter tends to look like it creates more depth going at 24 millimeter, 35, obviously this is the same scene. All the way 50, 50 being a standard for full frame. The way a lot of people describe it as almost the same way we perceive what the world 50 millimeter seems like a naturalistic um, sort of way of rendering a scene, okay? Wide angles can look quite distorted sometimes. And if you have people in a wide angle, it can be a bit odd, but we'll show you some examples where it'd be okay. Slightly telephoto, more telephoto, and then you're starting to get more detail, 200 mil and then a 400 mil. 
here. So you're starting to pull out details that are really not perceivable in the wide angles. Okay, so it gives you the ability to draw things closer to you and allow you to um, dictate the angle of view. A couple of things to remember or think about with telephoto is you can have this thing called telephoto full, uh, sorry, full pull, where if as the image shows on the right hand side here, this is taken from quite a distance away on quite a long lens. And it kind of feels like these people are much closer to here as they actually physically would be. They're probably standing very elevated up looking out on the scene, but because you're shooting with a longer lens, longer focal length, maybe 200 mil lens here, it feels like they're compressed into the background. It, it flattens out the scene and that can be quite good, quite useful sometimes. Wide angles also can you um, be used creatively. So I think this is Man Ray um, photograph here. So super wide angle lens. If the person or the subject is really close, you get lots of distortion, okay? So this becomes almost like an abstract shape or a, a sculptural element here. But this is somebody's physical legs basically, okay? So you can play with the fact that wide angles give you this look or feel if you photograph things quite close up. So this is a Greek photographer called Platon, and he photographs people sort of breaking the rule almost that we have where we, most people take photographs of people on longer focal lengths because it's flattering, it sort of compresses the features and it, it makes them look, um, yeah, it's a bit more flattering basically. Um, he technically uses the opposite. So he photographs portraits of politicians and celebrities and things like that, but uses the wide angle distortion. So you'll get them to put an L, a part of their body or um, close to the, the lens. And here you can see George Bush Sr. Um, and his fingers and hands look gigantic proportionally. Again, here, I can't remember this guy's name, um, another American politician, huge hands, and that's not how he is. Um, photographing politicians, they make them look like they've got small heads is probably quite appropriate in my my books. But yeah, you can see he plays with the distortion. So if you're doing things like reproducing artwork or photographing products, you do tend to use more of a telephoto lens because um, there's less distortion in them. There is still some, but it looks less distortion. It can also be flattering for portraiture. Um, I, again, would use wide angle lenses for interiors or architectural work um, so they can show a lot of the context in the space without going crazy wide because that can be really distorting. It's like when people go to view a house to buy or, or rent and um, you get there and the images are absolutely nothing like the space that you walk into which is much smaller. Okay. So lens types that you can use um, you've got prime lenses, so I talked about a nifty 50. So these tend to be simpler optically inside. Um, they tend to be a bit sharper and optically superior, easier to produce, less distortion. Because if you can imagine, the, the glass elements don't have to move in and out to accommodate any changes in field of view in the way that a zoom lens has to. Okay, They can also be much faster, so um, wider apertures. Um, it's easier to make them a nice open aperture, right aperture. Um, so they're less complicated to make, but um, so sometimes they're cheaper, but not always. So a zoom lens is a variable focal length or field of view. Um, and this field of view offers more opportunities in the single lens. Okay, With a, a fixed focal length, a prime lens, you can you can just move back so that your, your field of view changes, but that does change the perspective a little bit. So we talk about zooming with our feet, but if you've got a zoom lens, you can go from a wide angle lens to a telephoto lens in the one lens. So you can only, only need to carry about one lens. They tend not to be as sharp as the um, prime lenses that you can get in your, um, so prime lenses like this. So, when you've got a tele, uh, uh, zoom lens, it's much more complex, complex optically to produce. 
they tend not to be as fast so the aperture the maximum aperture that it can resolve or open up to is not going to be <clears throat> is not going to be um, as wide as this one oh macro lens so it's not going to open as wide as this this might tend to have an f 3.5 maximum aperture and the zoom lenses that are more um, expensive, if you like, would have a fixed a fixed aperture through the full zoom. So if you buy an f2.8 zoom lens, you're going to pay a lot more money than an, a zoom lens that might go from f5.6 to f6. Point something. Okay, so they're more complicated to make, so they're optically more problematic. The last one that you can sort of maybe buy are macro lenses where you can get very close to your subject and reproduce um, small things much larger than um, you could with a normal lens. So the minimum focusing distance is much, much closer. So I wanted to kind of talk about exposure basics because when we're using semi-automatic modes, it's really important that you understand what's going on inside the camera. So exposure in photography refers to the amount of light that reaches the camera sensor. Obviously that's different from the aperture because the aperture and the shutter speed need to work together as well as the ISO, okay? Correct exposure will result in a properly lit and balanced image, while an incorrect exposure will result in an image that looks too dark or too bright, okay? So in the following sort of, um, slides, we're gonna look at different aspects of exposure. So what is exposure? It's a good balance between highlight and shadow. It should represent the scene as you see it. And you can be creative with exposure compensation. And we will talk about exposure compensation because it's going to be important to be able to use that. Okay. It's a moving target. Now, this is an interesting one because you can use your exposure creatively. Okay. If you do, um, you start to understand how the meter works, you're going to basically realize that you're not going to do what your camera always says you should do. So the meter itself is the aspect of your camera um, that registers the amount of light coming through the lens. And because of that, it's it makes a calculation to balance your exposure okay or just read the value itself so the one thing to remember about meters are they are dumb okay your meter is really stupid it only understands one thing which is something called 18 percent gray mid gray okay that's all it understands and that's what it's looking for all the time i'll explain more of that in a second so the meter wants to deal with an average scene. It wants to understand where this mid gray point is. And in an average scene, if it gets the mid gray point right, the image is good. It'll, it'll actually register good brightness, good um, color values, all that, okay? It wants to deal with an average scene and not every scene is average. So the mirroring mode determines how much of your image the meter considers, okay? Metering modes we've talked about initially, so they can uh, use different types of metering mode to adjust how much the meter is really looking at so that you can get a better result. And the meter almost, not always, but can go very wrong. Okay, so the meter goes wrong in lots of ways. So if we are measuring exposure, so you're given, you're basically measuring the amount of light that is reaching the sensor, okay? So how do we do that? Most cameras, you're going to half press the shutter and it's going to take a meter reading, okay? So the built-in light meter in your camera will look through the lens, TTL, as you see here, and the sensor or the cell will measure the light being reflected off subjects and it will give you a reading, okay? 
So anything that the camera or is seeing, anything that the light is bouncing off, will also affect the amount of light that it sees through the lens. And that affects um, or can make things, excuse me, go wrong. Okay. So you have to consider the surface of the subject as well. So if you're going to switch on your camera um, and you can press the meter halfway down and it will read the cell. Okay. It will read the, the value. So it will give you uh, a meter reading in your camera, which should give you a shutter speed, an aperture and an ISO. Okay. You can usually see that on the top of your camera body, or if you're looking through the viewfinder, it will show you there as well. It depends on what mode you're going to be in. So we're going to be in aperture priority mode. So it'll still give you a shutter speed and aperture and ISO value. You need to also take into account the ISO speed. So making sure that you have maybe locked down your ISO speed to, I don't know, 800 is a good starting point. Okay. Or 400 if the light's okay. And you can set the exposure or the different values through aperture or sharp priority. So just remember the meter is colorblind. They only see shades of gray. And what they're looking for is this value in the middle. So the actual meter reading, the, the basis of the meter reading is based on that value, that mid gray value. So you should have dark darks and light lights or whites and blacks in your images. So as long as it gets the balance correct, you should have contrast and balance in your image. So mid gray is a universal measurement standard for photography. Okay, so meters are calibrated for this 18% gray. But where does it come from? So there's a guy called Ansel Adams, who um, was uh, part of the F64 group, and he's famous for images like this or similar to this. So he developed something called the zone system, whereby he, if you look at a scene like this, and basically your camera will do the same thing, but digitally, and you can break it down into different zone values. Okay, so zones from zero being pure black and um, this side being pure white. Okay, so zone five in the middle here is a mid gray. And he realized that if you worked out from your scene, depending on if you want it to be brighter or darker, depend on take where you take this value from. If you calculate your exposure from a mid-tone value, that means that your blacks will slot in and your whites will slot in. Okay. But you need a mid-tone value in your image. If your image is almost completely black or almost completely white, this is where it falls to bits. Okay. So they're designed to assume that any subject matter will be an, have an average mid-gray value. So therefore the subjects are recorded as mid-gray, whatever tone they are. So when that creates problems, when you get metering errors, is when you have very black or very white scenes. So a lot of cameras, if you look at your camera, might have a scene for the beach because the the manufacturers know that a beach reflects a lot of light. Okay. So you basically will get the camera creating an incorrect exposure unless it knows that that beach should be um, exposed in a different way to your average scene. Okay. In the same way as if you have a darker scene that's like a black velvet um, object on a, in a black background it will still try and create a mid gray value. Okay. So it'll pull the exposure into mid gray when it's actually should be black. So when you're shooting on semi-automatic modes, um, or even if you're just using the meter generally, you'll see that anything that's backlit or bright will cause the meter to underexpose. Okay. So it'll um, underexpose the scene because it's looking for that mid gray. It's not looking for pure whites. Okay. It'll try and underexpose it. If you're shooting black objects, it will um, overexpose. So it will give you mid gray, not black. Okay. So you need to remember that. So if you're photographing subjects like these, to get this to be white and render white and not blow out or, or be mid gray, you have to know that the meter is dumb 
and you're going to have to do something like overexpose it. And that's where exposure compensation comes in, okay? Where we can override what the camera is going to show you or take, going to expose. Same here, black object on a black background. Um, that would be um, pulled out in mid gray. You want it to be actually black. And here, same scene, if this is just an image that you took a meter reading for, it would try and get a meter read between these two values and it would just look rubbish. Whereas if you know your meter and understand it, you can change the exposures to make a silhouette like this. Okay. So metering modes can help a little bit with that. But one thing I didn't say here, it's really useful to kind of test this out. Um, and I tend to have boards on the wall in the classroom if we're in in the classroom i might just pop these up again so if you've got a matte white board a matte gray board and a matte, matte black board and you frame your shot where you have the whole of the board filling your entire frame in your image take a, take a photograph of the black one then take a photograph of the mid gray one then take a photograph of the white one when you look at them on the screen, they will all have been shot at mid gray. Okay. So it shows you where your metering errors come in. Okay. It will render whatever it sees as mid gray. So we did get look at metering modes initially. Um, I think the first practical lesson I got you to change these. So why would you maybe change your metering modes for different reasons? So the metering mode is looking for this mid gray, but it will determine the mid gray based on different um, areas, if you like. So if you have the kind of center weighted average metering, which is a mode that will be called different things on Canon, Nikon, whatever, but it's taking an average of quite a large area of your image like this. Okay. And you can see it's maybe slightly dominant in the middle. Okay. So it'll take its meter read from here because mostly your subject will be there. Partial metering mode will give you a smaller percentage, this is saying 8 to 13%, and spot metering can be 2 to 4% here. Okay. So why would we use different ones? So if we we're if I'm shooting something like a bride standing in front of a really bright window, um, I might use spot metering mode um, to meter off of the mid-gray from her white dress, something like that. And that way I'm going to get a nice balanced exposure for her, the background might be quite dark and that's probably a nice thing. If she was standing against the window, I could do the same thing because if she had a big bank of bright windows in front of her and I took a general metering from that, basically it would try and balance outside and inside and the image would look rubbish, whereby if I metered for again a mid grey point in her dress or maybe a shadow under her chin, I would then blow out the entire background which would become white, pure white, almost like a studio shot. And she would be nicely metered for and balanced skin tones and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So you can change them out of the area that the meter actually calculates that mid gray from. And then that can help you to negate any of these situations where it's too dark or too light. And you can see that's just the duplication of that. This is a good video explaining metering modes, spot metering. Um, it, it goes into a lot of depth, so feel free to kind of watch through that. So how do we kind of negate the fact that we know the meter's probably going to get wrong? So we can use something called bracketing or exposure compensation. So what do we do with bracketing? So we know maybe it's going to get it wrong, so we can take multiple exposures of the same scene. So by bracket exposures, we can get one shot where the frame is exposed correctly, one where it's underexposed, and one where it's overexposed. And you can get your camera to do this automatically if you dig into your menu structure and work out how to do that. It means that you'll get one under, one over, and one flat. And if your scenes are not an average scene, you're going to get a better shot from one of those three shots. And it's digital, so you can shoot lots. And you can see here, this is on the back of your camera. You can also see one through your viewfinder where you've got your meter. And you can see these dashes represent stops. Remember we are talking about stops? These could be aperture values, shutter speeds, or ISOs. And when we bracket, 
we are overexposing and underexposing. So this is a two stop difference, it's quite a big one. And here we've got one on, uh, two under, one flat and one uh, two over, okay? So you can bracket or you can um, change the exposure up or down. And the result will be something like this. So sometimes you can see that you have um, an image here where actually the foreground looks pretty decent, um, but the, the clouds are losing detail. So this is maybe a stop over, flat, and a stop under, okay? So this is useful because this element here might be good, and then this sky might be good. So digitally, you can take this out and add it to here and balance the sky in the foreground. You can also do it with filtration. So if you're filtering, um, physically putting a filter in front of your lens to drop the exposure on here, that can be useful. But if you bracket, you can also get the best of both worlds. And you'll find auto exposure, AEB, um, will be in your menu somewhere. So have a look and see how you can set that up. Okay. And again, this person goes into it in terms of wildlife photography. So it's a really good um, insight into using it for that. So the thing to also keep an eye on when we're out and about shooting is histograms. So the histogram is the graphical representation of the tonal values. And we're talking about how many um, pixels at that tonal value is in your, in your image, okay? So it's a graph that shows the distribution of brightness and darkness levels in your image. And this is really useful to get your head around because you need to remember that the back of your camera, the screen will lie to you, okay? And this will not. So it gives you a better representation of the darkness and lightness of your images, okay? So this is an atypical um, histogram, if you like. And you can see on the left-hand side here, you've got blacks. If this histogram was hitting this side, we'd lose detail in our blacks. If it was hitting this side, we'd lose detail in our whites. When we come to go to the edit process, you'll notice that Lightroom displays this right at the top because it's super, super useful, okay? So it's looking at the overall exposure and distribution distribution of highlights, midtones, and shadows, okay? And the histograms can be skewed one way or the other depending if they are um, for a high-key or low-key image, and we'll look at that in a second. So when you look at these examples, you can see that the actual histogram for the one on the left is like an average scene, if you like. You've got mid-tone values, you've got um, so shadow values, but a lot of blue in that shadow area. And here we've got highlights, and again, lots of blue in the peak here, okay? So this one is like a low-key image where you've got um, an image that looks like it's underexposed, but actually it's what you want to show. And then equally here, this is, what we call kissing the right side hand side of the scene. So we're losing some detail in this area, but it's allowed us to give a, a longer exposure and you still have some midtones and some shadow areas. Okay. So histograms can vary. They're not always like this. And if you break them down, they're also in terms of stop values. Okay. So we break brightness values up into zero to two, five, five, and we've got shadows, midtones and highlights, but they also represent stop values okay and this person again goes into histograms in quite a lot of depth so that's kind of all i'm going to discuss in the, the recording the lesson um we're going to be out and about which is great i think the weather forecast looks okay but again do wrap up warm you did see how cold it got the other week so um we're gonna have more light so we'll have more uh usable light until later which is good um, but we'll see how we go. On. So what we're going to do is we're going to be working in and around Bristol Square. We'll we'll meet up in um in front of Bristol Square, and I'll give you details of that on the chat on Teams. Um, we're going to use Aperture Priority, and we're going to shoot shallow depth field images, and then we're going to shoot deep depth field images. So at this point, I'll probably give you the tripods to take away, um, and I want you to work independently on this one. Okay. And I want you to think about shapes and compositions in your scene. Consider things like repetition, um, you know, so you can display 
um, a variation in depth, depth of field. Okay. And then once you've done that for a little while, we're going to have, I want you guys to go into twos. I want you to scout around the area and look for some really cool, interesting shapes in the round there. There's lots of stairwells, there's lots of kind of brutalist architecture and good backdrops. And I want you to take turns posing or shooting. And you need to consider where the light's come from, where the background is, and how it'll complement your image in the center. And then you want you to shoot a bunch of images, so a sets of images using different focal lengths and different depth of fields. Okay. So looking forward to the lesson when it comes up. Um, appreciate if you've lasted to the end of this, but I'll see you on Tuesday. I hope you could see you after the break. <laughs>